his job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. <laughs> And I'm Sean Magali from the Central Mass Workforce Investment Board. And we're joined today. We have uh, uh, another person in studio with us besides our producer extraordinaire, uh, Bob Zakowski. We also have Jonathan Cortez, one of the managers of Workforce Central Career Center, joining us. Well, thank you, Jeff. Manages the Milford uh, <laughs> office uh, down there. So, but Bob, uh, thanks for coming as, as a retiree. How are things going in your in your world? Great. Great. You have to speak Great. loud, actually. I just Great. realized you don't Great. have a microphone. I, I, we I, took I, it away. We, 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 we <laughs> will talk. But, Sean, things are quite busy without without having Bob in the office. I know. And, uh, I know. Very busy. A lot going on. Going to different meetings, filling in for Bob. It's. You can't fill his shoes. You can't. You can't. You can only hope to contain them. <laughs> so, uh, Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming and joining us. As you know, the show... Uh, <laughs> Show focuses Bob's on. Bob's got his shoes off here. And <laughs> <laughs> trying literally, to fill them. Literally. <laughs> Sean, uh, the, the, as you know, Jen, the, the show uh, focuses on workforce related yeah. things and yeah. what's going on with the local job market. So uh, we, we're excited to have you on the show, and you're going to talk about a big event coming up. Oh, Huge. yeah. No, I'm excited. Oh, we got to get him on the mic. Yeah. One of the biggest. One of the biggest events coming up. So uh, we're excited about it. And I'm, I'm thankful to be here with you guys. So tell us about the event. Well, actually, uh, it's the DCU Job Fair. It's okay. a collaborative effort between Workforce Central and the Sharks and the DCU Center. So it's a, it's a yeah. partnership. It's, uh, we've been doing this for a few years, and it's one of the biggest <coughs> job fairs held in the state of Massachusetts. Yeah, I think it is actually the, depending on which uh, metric you use, it's, I think it's, it's one of the largest. Uh, it is the largest for what I understand last year, the last actually, couple of years. We've, uh, we've had about uh, 70, 70 employers at one time. And uh, nearly, on average, about 2,000 job seekers who come in and visit us at the DCU. And this year, we actually moved it out. We typically hold it in conjunction with a Sharks game. Part of the promotion is that uh, with the DCU and the, and the Sharks is that uh, the job fair is held in the afternoon. And then that evening, there's a, uh, a, a hockey game. And it's usually uh, coupled with uh, the a good rivalry, the Worcester Providence Bruins. The baby uh, Bruins. Oh yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Uh, but this so. year they moved it out. We usually hold it in March, but this year we moved it out, uh, taking weather into consideration and what have you. We're going to be doing it on Friday, April eighteenth. Okay. The job fair actually runs from one to five in the afternoon, but folks start to uh, literally uh, line up as early as ten, eleven o'clock in the morning. Right. I mean, obviously with uh, two thousand job seekers, and that's our, that's what we're striving for again this year to yeah. keep pace with what our historical uh, uh, successes have been. Uh, we're looking to f move forward with that and, and uh, welcome everybody and anybody to come down and, and talk to one of up to 70 employers. Sure. I mean, it's a, what, what an opportunity, you know, to get in front of a number of different employers in the field you're looking for, to get that face time that you want. Um, what's some um, – What's up? Do you, do you have a list? I know. I know we're not going public with the. We don't go public with the list because, of course, as, as things uh, develop and change, so that that list will be coming out soon. Obviously, we're going to turn uh, turn the cl uh, calendar here shortly and be in and be in April. And at that point, we'll start to develop a formal list. But we do cover several industries. Mm -hmm. uh, we we cover the gamut. We go from A to Z. Um, you know, private entities, um, government agencies, uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, staffing agencies and companies because that's a big factor in today's uh, sure. labor um, pool nowadays. Um, we also will be doing um, some workshops and some informational seminars for folks, and that's very important because we, we like to have people have uh, a total ex overall uh, well-rounded experience. Not only will they come in and obviously um, network yeah. amongst uh, job with job seekers, with personnel from Workforce Central, but they'll also have the ability to meet with employers 
and then maybe partake in uh, a couple of the information sessions that we have that will hopefully help them moving forward. Yeah, that's a great opportunity for them to, to come and, and grab some further information about other resources that are out there or Absolutely. tips and tricks and all that. So, yeah, And, Jen, can you tell us a little, little bit about the uniqueness of, uh, like, a government agency like Workforce Central partnering up with a private sector, uh, the Worcester Sharks? Can you, can you talk oh, sure. about the uniqueness Actually, of that? Actually, what it does is it broadens uh, our ability to basically market and, and get recognition for the events that we're doing. We, we literally work with uh, the – the state system, if you will, uh, our fellow affiliates and sister organizations in terms of uh, the career centers, and there's 33 of them across the state, we market this uh, not only statewide but interstate. I mean, we have companies and or job seekers coming from northern Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh New Hampshire, Massachusetts, of course. Uh, so that's what we're, we're, this broadens our opportunity to market. We're getting people who are coming in who are, you know, coming in from all over. And this allows us to, to just really enhance uh, the visibility of it and the target audience. Um, so to emphasize and really just, you know, the total picture is to bring in as many people as we can and offer the services and the opportunities to find jobs that, that particular day. I mean, it's been successful in the folks that, in, in the sense that folks have been able to not only find jobs as a byproduct of the job fair, whether it be on site or as a follow up. So, uh, you know, as Jeff said earlier, it, it's a great, great opportunity for folks to come in and really have that one-on-one -on -one presentation and, uh, and make a difference. So how can business or, or organizations that might be hiring get involved with, with the event? It sounds like a great opportunity for them to meet job oh, sure. as well. So oh, well, what employers, employers are uh, invited to contact us. They can either contact John McCarthy at Workforce Central in Worcester. Um, his telephone number is 508 three seven three seventy six uh, zero four or they can call the DCU center and talk to Kristen Galante uh, her phone number is five zero eight nine two nine zero five eight six either one of those two contacts will provide uh, employers with all the information pertaining to the job fair I know that it's uh, it's for registration it's four hundred and seventy five dollars to partake in the in the job fair have a table uh, set up in the main area and with that it, it, I was just going to say, but, but it's, free, it's free for job seekers. It's free for job seekers. Okay. And employers also get uh, 30 tickets to that night's game. So a great opportunity for them to have a, a great family uh, or, or uh, event for yeah. their staff well, and well, reward well, their staff. Yeah, what well, right. we have found is that employers actually do one of – they can do multiple, multiple things. But one of the three top things that they do with it is they use it as a, a staff employee event in conjunction with the job fair. Um, they also use it as a customer appreciation event yeah. where they – give the tickets to you know some of their leading customers and their families, or even some have done the, uh, a very noble thing and donated the tickets to a charitable organization, such as the Boys Club or, or any other little organization in, in their area where they feel that they can then you know reward some of the children sure. or, or parents or families that uh, would typically not maybe not come to the game. So they get 30 tickets, they get the visibility of being there, um, and then, of course, they get to meet with uh, up to 2,000 job seekers who may be knocking on their door and, and right. filling these, these positions that they're looking for. It, and speaking of filling positions, I remember we did an interview with, uh, I think it was Tri-State Trucking last year, mm -hmm. you and myself, and, and they said they come every year the year prior to that they had hired two or three people and they they just love it so they they come every year do, right. do you find a lot of uh businesses come every year yeah they look I, forward to this event and and t to that point and thank you for re reminding me of that yes we do have a great um return in terms of uh, employers coming back uh so they've been successful that you know these are companies that and we bring in companies that are that have open positions we're not just bringing a company just to come in and and take up space and you know give out information we actually qualify companies who are coming in with open positions that they have to fill and of course we're seeking the information the statistics afterwards to make sure that you know we are providing them with uh both ends uh, job seekers and employers with a win-win scenario so that we can track uh, the results of this, and yes, companies come back because they're able to fill positions. They get qualified applicants, um, and if again, same time next year, they come back. They, you know, they know it's a productive event endeavor. Yeah, and and on the job seeker side, uh, are you recommending that job seekers come be, and connect with their career centers now and get their resumes together, get a number of copies of resumes? Oh, absolutely. To bring, uh, is, are there certain workshops that would be good to take prior to this? Well, event? what we do is we really ramp up on. Uh, 
providing workshops specifically geared towards the job fair, how to work a job fair. Because right. there's a lot of do and don'ts. I mean, right. people, oh, yeah. need, people need to understand that you're not going to be able to sit there for 35 minutes and speak with a, with a recruiter or somebody from human resources. Elevator pitch, right? Elevator pitch. 30 seconds, make your impression fast, hit them hard, and impress them, right? And, and walk away. You know, you're giving them their resume. You're gathering information. You're giving information, and then you're moving on. But you're making an impact. And that's right. how to work a job fair. Those workshops, we actually, um, in all three centers, most Milford, Worcester, and Southbridge uh, will partake in offering those more than normal, yep. uh, maybe twice, three times a week leading up to the job fair. So look at the calendars. Uh, I was going to say, folks can see the calendar of workshops online, www.workforcecentralma.org. Work yep. yep, that's the website. Look at all three because, again, you can if one fills up, you can go to another one. Uh, yeah. Utilize the, uh, the career center. Not only that, but if, if interested, uh, follow up with uh, a, a resume. Uh, to come talk to our counselors. We have certified uh, resume professional writers who can work with you. Yeah. Um, and then again, also, uh, there are interviewing technique workshops that people can take, um, which we'll talk to you about interviewing in general, but also be leading up to the uh, job fair, talk about a 30 second you yeah. know, kind of commercial. I, I think it's important as a job seeker to be prepared because, I mean, it sounds right. like it could be an overwhelming event. 80 employees, uh, uh, over 1,000 job seekers out there. You've got to stand out, you've got to be prepared. So you don't I, have time to, to, to be... Well, that's a mistake. You, don't, you know, this is an opportunity to you know, make... Can't a, wing it. You yeah. Know, no, you, you're going to make a mark right there. And uh, so you have that opportunity to come in and make an impression. So, I mean, obviously dress, dress accordingly. Um, you're going to be meeting directly with a human resource person, a, a company directly. So, um, you know, they're going to they're going to make a judgment or form an opinion right off, right off the bat. So bring bring your A game. Be prepared. Bring plenty of copies of resumes. Um, bring whatever notes you want to bring along. Dress accordingly, and uh, you know, hopefully, I think at the end of the day, we'll be successful again. We're we're speaking with Jonathan Cortez, the manager of Workforce Central Career Center down in Milford. Uh, so, Jens, tell, tell us a little bit about your personal background. How did you, uh, you know, kind of get with you where, where you're at now? Oh, okay. Um, and, you know, kind of what was your kind of career arc here to? Well, honestly, Jeff, uh, Worcester-born resident, uh, been here all my life. And uh, for the f- I guess uh, I've really had a two or three, only two or three jobs in, in my career. Um, for 16 years, I worked in private industry. I worked for a progressive IT company where I was the general manager. Uh, it was a central mass company, and we were able to expand that through uh, all of New England. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm very familiar with local business, uh, very familiar with, uh, you know, having employees and uh, things of that nature, and the challenges that a, that a local business would have. We had 16 to 20 employees yeah, under, yeah. in my tenure there. Um, so I, I understand what it's like to run a small business. I know the challenges, the economic challenges, uh, training, benefits, things of that nature. Um, so so that was a great foundation for what I you know for what I was doing in life and then moving forward I actually worked with the Department of Commerce for a couple of years the federal government and about three years ago I, uh, I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to join Workforce Central as an operations manager so for the last um, what 25 years of my life I've been in management mm-hmm. um, man in operations and have found out a lot of things through at Workforce Central that's that had I known as a uh, as a business owner uh, and involved with uh, a company like that, there are so many opportunities for employers to utilize and connect with uh, Workforce Central. There are uh, there's uh, grants and funding and programs right. to uh, train, retrain, hiring incentives. That uh, had I known, you know, a few years ago, it may have uh, made made a difference in in my career path. But I'm very lucky, very grateful for what I get to do because. Throughout all of those uh, positions, I worked with people, mm-hmm. um, and I enjoy giving back to the community. I enjoy working with people and helping folks who uh, so need some services. And well, I know the folks down in in, in Milford. Uh, uh, you know, very lucky to have you down there, no, kind of manning the, sh- the, the, <laughs> the ship. And, mm. and and I know that you've been very active too with um, with with also getting involved with the local school districts down there. And I'm excited and, about and that. And helping with that as well. So. Well, thanks for being on the show. Now, you can st- can you stick around for a few more minutes because we've got first uh, a little game we play with guests we like yeah. to like to play, and then we'd also uh, it might be good to get your take on some of the uh, some of the we're going to run through some of the local numbers. Fair okay, I'd love to. All right, Sean, we why go you to want, the game. You want, why don't we go to the little game? That so, we as a tradition, we we uh, we do the name the celebrity's first job. So we'll, we'll name a celebrity. We'll give you three jobs, and then you tell us which one was their real first job. Okay. And as a side, first job. Any interesting story on a first job? Uh, first job janitor. Ah. Janitor at uh, my high school. Paid my 
paid me my too. way through high school. Me too, actually. Oh yeah. During the summers. Uh, after school and during the summers. Oh, nice. Minimum wage was three twenty-five, I think. Oh. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so who do you want? We got, we got a choice for you. I, I, I prepared two. We could either do Mariah Carey or Oprah. Wow, you get a, a wow. choice. You're giving him a I'm choice. I'm giving him a choice. You know, I'm a sports guy. I've been in code. You couldn't come up with a sports character. So Mariah Carey <laughs> or Oprah. Well, you know, let's go Mariah. Mariah, all right. So it's Mariah Carey's first job, a Chuck E. Cheese mascot, a hat checker at a nightclub, hmm. or a door-to-door vacuum saleswoman. Jeez. Again, we've got Chuck E. Cheese I mascot, no, I don't see hat that. checker at a nightclub, or a door-to-door vacuum saleswoman. Uh, I, does the Chuck E. Cheese character actually sing? <laughs> or is that just like Penn 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 you know, that's a, yeah. I, yeah. I gotta look at this. I've seen him dancing. Right? There's I like don't know. animatronic I ones. The, the one I can tell you a story about yeah. Chuck E. Cheese, but I don't know if we have enough time. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go with the hat checker at the club. We, we got a winner. Wow! wow. Got a winner. Excellent! Yeah. Wow! Yeah. I guess she was. Uh, she, she started there. Actually, got fired because uh, because of her attitude. She had some attitude problems, and she was most of her concentration was going towards becoming a backup singer. Uh, really? Yeah. So she didn't have time to like. Deal with hats. Hats, hats no right. thanks. Uh, so where do I claim my prize? Jeff will get it to you. We'll, oh, yeah, we'll oh be getting it to you. <laughs> we're putting it, we're putting it in I, the can queue. I, can I donate it back then? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, hat checker, that, that's a job that's probably declined over the years, right? Yes, yeah, moved if out you look to at valet. The number, it's no valet. Right, I mean, not, not as many people wearing hats that get checked. It doesn't sound like a bad gig to me, hat checker. Yeah, but I mean, do you not have to deal with the coats too? Is it I'm just thinking the back in like the 30s and 40s, where I was like, let me check my hat. I've got my top hat. I'm going out. I wear a top hat right. or a Can't derby, maybe inside. a bowler or a derby. Nowadays, Can't wear hats. Who's wearing hats? They don't no. want you to wear hats. The hat checking industry, I think, has suffered dramatically with the social change of. Of or maybe she was a hat checker and checking it for well, polls. You know what? Had had she walked right. into a you career center, center, we could have turned around back with me. Did you hear could this plug here? This? See, had she come into the career center after she got fired from that position, we could have checked what her transferable skills were and maybe aligned her with other positions that were available we to her. We may have done wow. that. In we fact, we may have suggested she go into the entertainment industry. And, and maybe we would have had her do the Chuck E. Cheese thing. You, and you sing, are a Chuck E. Cheese mascot. Then, yes, as a matter of fact. Well... Uh, we, we did want to take a few minutes here, too, as well, to talk about some of the numbers. So we mentioned the decline in the hat-checking industry. Mm. <laughs> yes, we did. Overall, a significant decline that's, over the years. That's official, right? That's, oh, that's official. That's official. <laughs> that's official. Um, but uh, we have some numbers here for the local economy that we might want to just chat about, get your, get your take on. So uh, last month, for, for, for the month of February, uh, that's the last latest month that's out, the uh, the local here in Central Mass, not just Worcester, but all of Central Mass, the the unemployment rate, the official unemployment rate, which is which is not to get too technical, but the U three rate is is for for people that are kind of actively looking for work, um, is seven point three percent. In uh, Massachusetts, it's six point five percent, and in the U S. it's six point seven percent. So uh, Central Mass. There's a couple different ways of looking at this. Obviously, a higher rate does not suggest a positive, you know, comparison with the Massachusetts rate. Uh, And 7.3 to 6.5 seems to be um, a pretty big gap there. So, you know, uh, and and the 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 trend has been fairly flat, a little bit up, a little bit down over the months. You know, hasn't hasn't dramatically come down. but yeah, and, and so if, if you're, you know, if you look at it, the other, the other way that to look at it though, something to consider is that, you know, the U3 rate does track people that are actively engaged in the job market. So you're actively looking for work. Okay. And so what, what sometimes happens is um, if people leave the job market, they say they get frustrated, uh, maybe they're older and they say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to just gonna be retired or whatever. They um, they drop out of that statistic so altogether. They're not counted. They're not counted. So oh. your rate. So it's interesting if you kind of compare numbers of how many how many uh, people are employed. Sometimes that number will drop, while at the same time, the employment rate will drop, which seems very counterintuitive, right? Uh, and that's because people are le- actually leaving the job market. Mm-hmm. So down in North Carolina, they they um, they a very um, conservative approach to 
employment benefits. They actually, so the the uh, the st the federal rate was is what twenty six weeks of unemployment insurance. The regular unemployment regular unemployment, claim, right. and then there there's um, a state extension or a, a state correct amount, which in Massachusetts I think brings you up to like thirty four weeks. Yeah, I, I, thirty five. Yeah, say? Yeah, I mean, around, you yeah. give it around there. Yep. And then the federal extensions had been in place through the stimulus. So the federal extensions had gone away. In North Carolina, about six months ago, they also they did away with basically everything above, I think, I want to say 20 weeks. Wow. So it's the lowest amount of unemployment insurance benefits in so, the country. So the shortest period. Yes, by like six weeks or something right. or even more. So it's, it's, by, it's, in a way, it's a natural experiment on how does it work. Now, the unemployment rate after that six months later – has gone down pretty dramatically. I, I, they're, they're well below like the national average, and so state officials are touting it as, "Hey, we've look what we've done. We told you if you if you cut it, more people are going to be just like forced to take whatever they can get and go back to work, and that's that, right?" So, um, but there's more to the story. What they actually find is there's the same number of people working that were working before they they made that shift. Now there's just a ton more people Dropping that have off. gotten so f so frustrated with it. They're, they're out of the labor market. So their employment, their population of people who are in the labor market, mm -hmm. who could be in the labor market, so like are dropping be, out. the employment ratio of people is also like the lowest in the country. So, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of get that argument of, hey, geez, you know, if you give people 99 weeks, 112 weeks, they're going to be maybe, uh, you know, apt to stay on. The unemployment mm -hmm. rolls longer and, and be a bit more choosy about the jobs and all that. So I, I get that argument, but I think there's somewhere in the middle there that you have to kind of factor in, right? You can't just say, well, you're not getting any, any unemployment benefits. That way, you know, you're going to be – if there's no jobs available, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, and it's also – it'll be interesting, too, to look at North Carolina's crime rate and other indicators, youth poverty – you know, like I'm like children's, you know, uh, mortality. I mean, I, I wonder yeah. how what the ripple effects this might be, of of a very tightened no, safety absolutely. net, right? Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're talking about you're talking about people. I mean, folks, families, lives that are you know obviously affected. Um, there are difficulties in finding jobs. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are sometimes there's not that many jobs available. I mean, we you have to look at a lot of a lot of factors and and again to to kind of put it all in a nutshell to say that uh, folks, you know are either looking for aggressively or not or, you know, uh, abusing the system or just trying to, you know, get by. Uh, there's a lot of people that we have that come to the career centers who uh, from day one are taking a proactive approach. Yeah. You know, um, and uh, you, you'll find that people who do utilize the career center and are diligent about their job search um, and, you know, coming to terms with, uh, you, know, my, you know, fixing their resume and uh, enhancing their game, if you will, yeah. their, the, the, their prof you know, you have mid, you know, mid managers coming in, uh, executives, uh, and not to just, uh, you know, stereotype, but you would they come in with a, you know, I'm good attitude. I know, I know what a good resume is all. like. I know how to interview, and yet when you start to talk to these folks, you realize that there's uh, areas. That could be improved and how you handle. I mean, everything. Or things to, change too. Right? Things I have mean, changed. You yeah. know, um, they, online. The now. resume has changed. You know, the formats. The you know how to put together a a very strong resume. Yeah. A lot of people get a, a phone call for an interview, and the first thing is not come to my office and meet with me. The first thing is we're going to spend five to ten minutes with you over the phone. Right. Yeah. And their phone mannerisms are not to par. And they don't realize that, of course, somebody who's nervous, who's very professional, who's very proud of what they've done, is now trying to squeeze into a 10-minute phone interview, mm -hmm. you know, everything that yeah. they can do because they're trying to make that impression. And guess what? You've just turned that employer off. You never get past that phone that interview. First, so yeah. these are skills yeah. that people need to, you know, realize is, is prevalent in today's job market. Yeah. These are the things, these are the things that are going to happen. Resume, and you have to know how to tailor that resume and how to make it a, uh, a visible resume in a pile of hundreds of resumes, yeah. especially if you're doing online applications. I was going to say online applications. I mean, that's all, yeah. you know, so they, these things are being scanned. This isn't like when I was in business, you know, if I, if I had a service technician position that, that was open, 
I had to wait for the mailman to come in right, for about right. two weeks after I put in the Sunday ad. You know, the old yeah. new, the remote newspapers? Bob, you remember newspapers, right? <laughs> yeah. we, we had those back in the day where you would run an ad in the newspaper, yeah. wait every Monday and see how that hits. Right, yeah. And then you'd and then you're literally hand, read, hand, read, read every yeah. resume. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. Um, staffing agencies have become the, the human resource department through a lot of big companies and people. Yeah. Are the still, per still model and, and people yeah. still believe that these are temp agencies. I'm below, you know, working with a temp agency. I'm not a contractor. I'm a full time employee with a lot of folks. There was a lot of changes in the labor market today, and these are the ways that life has changed. And, and, and we're trying to educate, inform, coach, and mentor folks so that they're best positioned to find jobs. So, you know, these statistics speak to a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, good and bad. I mean, obviously, you can slant them any way you want. Uh, but at the end of the day, individuals need to be responsible for their job search activities and utilize the resources in the career center, which unfortunately is a hidden jewel in, right. in terms of what we do across the state, uh, is a viable option for everyone to come in, well, better another, their chances. It, it, for, I mean, at the very least, you're going to get some information that, that you can kind of kind of run through and, no, and sure. compare with other sources that you're getting. and. Even if you, so, whether you're a seasoned professional or you're just entering the the labor market Absolutely. for the first time, there's something you can take from the career center, and and you know it, it is offered to you at no cost. You can you can you know take kind of from it what you, what you want, and 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 if, right. if there's other things that aren't you know particularly uh, relevant for you, then 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 you know you're no worse off for having heard it probably than so so for something for everybody and to take it like you said a hidden jewel out there of, of all these services that are available through the Career Center Network, uh, including to business, like you said. I mean, when you were in Very business and, and, and weren't aware of that. So, um, well, thanks for coming in. We've been, we've been talking with Jonathan Cortez, the uh, manager for uh, Workforce Central Career Center down in Milford, Massachusetts. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed coming here. We appreciate it. And we owe you a mug now. We owe you a mug for <laughs> oh, your... Oh, we, oh, we now know what the gift is. The parting gift it is, is a mug. mug. Oh, I'm sorry. We didn't tell you. It is a mug. Okay. Well, uh, courtesy <laughs> of Penta Communications that had donated... Uh, oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. The last time I won something, I was on the Bozo the Clown Show, and I won a Tootsie Roll. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm moving up in the world. You're, you're definitely moving. Well, you're a TV <laughs> shot. It's TV yeah, star. Yeah, this is, this is not a new thing I, for you. You've... Yeah, I, win, I win trivia contests. I, I probably doesn't even know who Bozo the Clown is or a Tootsie Roll. I no, Tootsie Rolls. Tootsie Rolls is still around. Right? I had still a Tootsie exist. Roll bank. I think in, in oh, Bozo yeah. still exists somewhere in Bozo. some sort of syndication or something. Rex Trailer. Remember Rex Trailer? I don't. I just remember the name, actually. I think he, I think he took like a... Oh. Who was the, the, the clown that squeaked when he talked? Do you know who I'm talking about? Squeaky the Clown? Who am I talking about? Squeaky the Clown. He talks like this. He's like, hey, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm the clown. That sounds terrifying. I want to say <laughs> I want to say he was with Rex Trailer, and they used to take like an annual. <laughs> so we're going to do clown <laughs> impersonations. That's a little bit what we're, what we're doing. Uh, yeah. I'll do Homie the Clown. Just an <laughs> hour. Just an hour of Squeaky the Clown references. So, well, thanks again for being on. Oh, it's no, great it to see pleasure. you again. Thank you. And uh, best it's of luck with the job fair again. That's April 18th over at the DCU Center. Uh, space is still available for uh, employers to get involved with that. They do yes. get 30 free tickets to the Sharks game yes, that they night. Do. Yes, they do. And job seekers can come on by there. It's between 1 and 5, and they can also get discounted tickets uh, to the game that night as well. So. Yep. And, uh, you know, just a couple last things on that. There's, there is public transportation wow. accessible. Um, there is parking. There are parking lots uh, readily available uh, around the DCU Center. And uh, there are information centers, information sessions that will be running between concurrently with the, the job fair itself. So, you know, come on early and, um, you know, it's 1 to 5. And uh, workshops will be going from uh, about 1 to 4.30. So Excellent. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, do we have time for, for a little break in here? Are, we gonna, are, are you going to – I'm going to give you this microphone so you can do our public service uh, – as we do this technical thing here, uh, you know, this is, this is our membership drive time here at WCUW. And if you have made a pledge to WCUW as a new member, we ask you to be sure to send those in to WCUW 90, uh, 910 Main Street in Worcester. Zip code is 01610. And if you are not a member and would like to become a member of WCUW, you can go online to WCUW.org and uh, become a member that way and make contributions or send in a check. Make sure you circle that uh, you are supporting uh, the working lunch 
here at WCUW. Excellent. And, and so what, is there a standard? Uh, it's a donation, right? But is there, there so are, it's tax? There, uh, there, there are donations. It's tax deductible, but also for a membership is $40. And that's because of the f 40 years that WCUW has been on the air for brand new members. And we have a lot of members that are signing up and year after year after year supporting all types of programming. And we're asking you to support, you know, the working lunch right here at WCUW. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zakowski, for that wonderful announcement. That's certainly a, a very worthy uh, uh, cause, whether you're supporting this program or the, or the other fine programs here and a lot of programs that you just don't get on other, you know, other stations across the dial. You know, I, I know they do a, a SCA program. Just like you know, the night, Polkas. The Polka Show yeah, on, on, Polka Saturday, the, on Saturday with and own? Sundays from 2 to 4. And that's right. A little plug. That's right. A little plug. Got to get that in. Well, you know, uh, speaking of community support, there's um, a program out there, a project out there called Youth Connect, which is a, a collaboration of a number of different youth programs, youth serving programs uh, in Worcester that, you know, really kind of has become a, a bit of a national model uh, out there. So we were able to talk with uh, the project director and have a great conversation with her. And why don't we, why don't we go to that interview right now, Sean? This morning? Got it. Okay. Very good, Jeff. Very good. How are you? Good. Thanks for taking the time to uh, to speak with us. So, tell us a little bit about the Youth Connect project. Well, Youth Connect is a collaboration of youth serving agencies, and I call them the primary youth serving agencies in the Worcester community: uh, Boys and Girls Club and Girls Inc., the YW and YMCA, the uh, Worcester Youth Center, and Friendly House are the primary agencies, and then. U Inc. is a, a fiscal agent for us and has also started implementing a adventure challenge uh, education program um, that's part of the collaboration. So those agencies have come together to serve youth across the city, and uh, we focus primarily on uh, middle school kids. Great. Well, it sounds like you've got, you know, a lot of the, the – kind of anchor institutions, if you will, around the city serving uh, youth, especially, you know, if you're talking middle school, probably doing a lot of services uh, during the after school hours, those hours that are probably the most, um, uh, where youth are most at risk out there. So what's some of the elements of the project itself? Well, um, the program, the collaboration actually started as a summer program, the YouthNet program, which has been a very popular program since the early 90s here in Worcester. And um, it's a, in, as a summer program, it runs in the evenings from 6 o'clock in the evening till 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. And we were transporting kids from around the city to uh, participate in programs at these different agencies. Um, what we decided to do was that, you know, that was so successful during the summer, um, there was the need to start to pay some attention to what was going on during the school year and how much more efficient we could be if we pulled our resources during nine months and 12 months out of the year instead of just the three. So um, this group of agencies has really been able to, in, in my mind, move the needle around services for middle school kids and connecting these middle school kids to services that they may not have had an opportunity to take advantage of. Um, one of the indicators that we use for our program is how engaged the kids are when they come to us during the summer, and we ask them a question of whether or not they've ever participated in programs at any of the agencies. And usually we're sitting in the area of 60 to 75 percent of the kids have never been in the door of any one of those agencies. Wow. I'm surprised by that. Well, when we started doing this 20 years ago, um, that number was even higher. So that's something that I use as an indicator that we're going in the right direction with our programming to connect these kids. Um, in the at the early years of the program, that number was in the 90% range. So uh, kids are getting more connected across the city than they used to be, and that's because we've really been paying some intentional uh, time to that. Um, one of the things that the agencies are currently working on is a large transportation collaborative that we're sitting with a group of leaders across the city now trying to figure out where the different 
transportation uh, programs are that are happening for kids, what the resources are that they could use um, that are, we're already making available, but they're just not taking advantage of them, um, and ways that we might need to supplement those existing systems in order to make sure that kids do have that access that we're trying to give them. So it sounds like the, the leaders of these organizations through the Youth Connect project come together to look at at kind of alignment of services and, and sharing kind of best practices and it sounds like they're you know they're, they're working hand in hand to 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 work together as opposed to working in silos is that so they're looking at at, at issues around that that's that's an excellent way to uh, say that Jeff I mean that what I can tell you is that I've never seen a group of leaders um, that work the way these um, executives work. They truly do put their own individual agencies' needs aside when they come in that room, and they're there for the youth of the community. And um, that's very um, engaging as an employee to work for a group of people like that. Um, now, is there, is there, what's, can you talk about the connection to Worcester Public Schools and how, you know, obviously these are, are middle school students. They're, um, I'm sure there's some engagement with between the, the, the programs in the schools, uh, at least informally. Can you, can you speak a little bit about that? Well, many of the programs um, in the past had been funded through the public schools to do after-school programs or to supplement by having uh, school programs come to their sites or in a variety of different ways. Uh, those things still continue to happen, but uh, I guess the thing that I see happening is that as a group, um, the Youth Connect partners, are having conversations with administration, people at the Worcester Public School level, to really intentionally align our services. So uh, training opportunities and staff development opportunities are shared back and forth. Um, I was at a meeting the other day where somebody said they weren't sure how the information got out, but there was like 30-some different community people that were at a uh, public school training the other day. So um, there's a lot of cross-training going on for our staff, and that really helps us build capacity to serve our kids and, and try to drive down the same road as we uh, do our work. Um, we also know that some of the programs that we do are done better in the community after school, and I think that I've seen the public schools come to uh, that position over the years as our collaborations have increased. So there, there's a, a large amount of collaboration that goes on in the city of Worcester, unlike any community that I've seen, and we are uh, talked about at the national tables uh, because of that. So uh, being able to take advantage of those existing collaborations in the city are very important. Um, I know that I work with you at a couple of those tables. That's right. That's right. Well, and one of the things that I'd heard about the project that I think is very exciting is you're also uh, sharing uh, information about about the young people you're serving, and you know, young people uh, often attend more than one program. So, so you're actually can you can you speak a little bit about the uh, about the collaborative from the standpoint of of data sharing and and uh, you know information about about case management. Oh, I'd love to. That's actually one of our largest priorities and a place that I try to spend most of my time. Um, one of the things that brought us together as a collaborative uh, over a 12-month period instead of just during the summer was the necessity to understand kind of where kids were moving in the city, uh, which agencies were serving kids. We understood that um, a person that comes to the YWCA might also be somebody who's going to the Worcester Youth Center and might also be somebody who gets services from Friendly House. So uh, there's, um, there's networks of programs that work well together. There's uh, agencies that are nearby in the community, and, and they share families' kids because of uh, gender-specific programming. So we knew we needed to get a handle on kind of where kids were moving, how they were moving, and... We also wanted to start to measure some very consistent indicators around our youth. So uh, we know that academic success is important. We know that um, health and uh, fitness is important. And we also know that each of our agencies have different expertise when it comes to some of these programs. So we wanted to make sure that we were pushing the best practices that we had forward and that 
agencies were able to help each other build capacity to implement those programs. Is, and the, potentially, there needed to be some type of a formal referral system between organizations so that we could make sure that the best of what we had to offer was what kids had access to. Well, that, that sure makes a lot of sense. Is, is the system that you've set up, I guess, robust enough to, if, if someone is maybe taking a turn, um, you know, for the worst, or having a, having you know something happening in their life, and they're and they're you know starting to maybe go down the wrong path, is that something that if if you know you know that that say little Bobby goes from the boys club over, he does some swimming at another place, or he does some other activities with um, with other organizations, is that something that that you're you're you know able to give up a you know a heads out to their staff that that you know you've seen and they might be able to offer some some extra support there. Well, absolutely. That's one of the things I think that we find that's exciting about using the tool that we're using. So the tool that we've decided to use is uh, Social Solutions Efforts to Outcomes, which is a real-time data management system. So yeah. um, the thing that was hardest for me to get used to was that I could sit down and run a report today and then sit down and run that same report um, 10 days later, and it would look different. Yeah. Um, because there's data constantly being entered into the system. So, yes, the, an the quick answer to your question is yes, it's robust enough that I'll be able to see uh, progress um, or not with individuals in real time. And if there's a particular youth, I know there's a number of programs that we are involved with through the city that work with targeted youth. So there's the ability to look at just that subset of youth and see what they're doing across the city once we can get their information in. Um, the Boys and Girls Club here in Worcester has been using this software for about three years now. So I, sitting here and working with Boys and Girls Club, I've been able to really get a good sense of what this tool will be able to do for the agencies. Um, the tricky part is the is the designing of the system so that each of the agencies that's part of this is getting what they need out of this system. Yeah. So um, that's kind of where we are now. And, and as a matter of fact, I was just on a call earlier this morning trying to set up um, a list of very intentional people to put around the table to make sure that we're collecting the indicators that we need to be collecting and we're not going to create some hole in the system somewhere. Well, certainly um, bringing folks together and and creating just that network of, of shared information, um, you know, with data privacy, with, with with just the mechanics of collecting the information, staff input, and all of that goes with it, and, and each individual uh, organization stepping up to, to do that. That must have been a Herculean task just in and of itself. So I, I, I could, you know, certainly applaud you for, for um, you know, making the strides that you have, even in, in just that one area. And I know that you've you've had such success in a, in a variety of areas. Like you said, it is a national model that's out there. I know that it's gotten a lot of buzz about, about you know, various components of it. Um, we're, we're talking with Judy Kirk, the Director of Community Impact at the Boys and Girl, Girls Club of Worcester and the Youth Connect uh, uh, program. Uh, Judy, tell us a little bit, if we could segue a bit, uh, about your, so you're the, you're the project leader for that. You mentioned, you know, you're looking at indicators. You're you're bringing the partnership together. What's some of the things that you do in your role? Um, well, primarily that is my role is to bring all those partners together. Um, I, when you you say community impact, it is kind of a, a buzzword these days, um, but not too many people understand what it is. Um, so community impact is a combination of things. It is assessment related. It's showing outcomes and progress on indicators so that you can really show your impact across a community. But the other piece of that is uh, trying to have true impact on systems that are operating in the community and, and how things work. So that networking that happens is something that I particularly enjoy. Um, I do come from a, a background of data collection, though. I, back in the early 80s, I... My master's degree was in measurement and evaluation, and I, I don't know that I realized how important that was going to be in my future. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, what's if you could if you could take a minute, how did you get where you're at? Oh well, um, 
So I guess I'm, we're, we're the, 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 the shorter version of this. Yeah, the shorter <laughs> version. Um, I've worked for a lot of youth-serving agencies, primarily female youth-serving agencies, uh, Girls Inc., YW, Girl Scouts. Um, so that's where my primary background comes from. Um, so I've been doing youth development all of my life. I was trained as a physical education teacher and really seemed to go down the path of recreation. So ended up doing uh, social service and youth serving agencies instead of um, education, but always knowing the importance of academic success in the work that I was doing. So um, the working for a variety of different organizations, learning um, how a variety of different groups have done things, understanding that many of us are all working toward the same end, I think um, kind of guided me toward this position of community impact with um, the seven different youth organizations that I'm working sure. with right now. It, it's very exciting to sit at a table with the leadership that comes from those agencies and and see them work together and see what the different strengths are that they have um, and being able to take advantage of some of the coaching that comes from that. Well, certainly your background, uh, you know, lends itself perfectly to the effort and, you know, having worked with you myself on a number of different projects, um, you know, I think it's, you know, a combination of your experience and your and your style and your management skills, I mean, really speak highly to the to the effectiveness of what you've been able to do to bring all these organizations together and, and have them kind of buy into some shared um, uh, delivery of programs and services and, and information. So, again, this uh, talking with Judy Kirk, the Director of Community Impact for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Worcester. I want to thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, before we let you go, though, we, we do like to play a game with all our guests. And, um, and this is... You warned me about that. Well, yes, this is a... Sp yes, exactly. We're throwing a curveball at you. Um, <laughs> So what we like to do is we play a little game here. We're going to give you a, a we're going to give you a, a celebrity. We're going to give you three um, three choices for their first job, and you're going to pick one. If you pick the right one, you're going to get a a, a beautiful uh, coffee mug, courtesy of Penta Marketing, who had donated those mugs to us for this uh, uh, reason. So here we go. Okay, it's the the celebrity is Matt Damon. Do you know Matt uh, Damon? Do you, have, do, you, do you know who we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So here's three choices uh, uh, for his first job. Was he, A, a break dancer uh, for cash at Harvard Square? And I can, I can already boop, 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 yeah. Was he a hot dog vendor at Fenway Park? Or was he, C, a construction worker apprentice? So construction <laughs> worker, hot dog vendor, or break dancer? Which I'm one do you think was... Now I see him in a hard hat, so I'm going to go construction. Yeah, you know, you would think so. I think he's got the, you know, kind of a, kind of that look about him. Uh -huh. By the way, uh, more information about uh, about the choice. Damon claims that the that this rumor... About him started by was started by a childhood friend, actor Casey Affleck, had started this rumor about him. So your choice is construction worker. Unfortunately, it was actually break dancer. Oh my word! And again, Casey Affleck uh, started this uh, started spreading the word about his friend's activities. First job. Any break dancing in your background, Miss Cook? Not in mine. <laughs> well. Just it's never it's never too late. Uh, again, want to thank you for, for for being here, Judy Kirk, the director of Community Impact for the Boys and Girls Club of Worcester and, and the Youth Connect program. Thank you so much for taking the time. Absolutely, Jeff. Thanks for the call. Thanks All right, we're back Bye -bye. here live Bye. now. That was that was good. Like, again, it's just an, an amazing uh, collaboration of all those youth serving entities, and. And, of course, we ended it with a reference to Matt Damon breakdancing, and Jonathan and I were just reminiscing about my days breakdancing break in Worcester. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Walter Pope was, uh, was was like the rival crew, you might say. Yeah, you, you, you're throwing out names? Are you kidding me? Yeah, he was. He, well, I think a lot of the <laughs> listeners out there might remember uh, back in the 80s there. With, oh, absolutely. With, uh, with me, with my members-only jacket. Uh, That's a look. Flying around. Carry my own cardboard. What was your song? Go, white boy, go, white boy, go. Is that where that originated from? Were you breakdancing in the streets of Worcester? I may have. I may have. What was your like signature move? 
I, 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 I did the, the, the pop and lock stuff. Uh, I was never really good with the ground game. Right. More more the pop and the lock. That was Jonathan's. I don't want to brag. I don't spin. want to brag. I, I think I was in the top three at St. Peter Marion for breakdancing, which is, <laughs> which is kind, you know, kind of like saying, you know, crew. like you're, you know, like the tallest, you know, person I, 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 in the, you know. And who would you guys go up against? I don't know, whatever. The you know what I'm saying? The whole name breakdance crew? Oh, the whole name crew. <laughs> the, the St. Naps. John's, the, the no. Pioneers. Or? Yeah, we could really. That is a battle. Epic, epic, epic stuff right Epic now. battles. No, we used to, you know. Catholic school breakdance contents in the 80s. Wow. <laughs> There was some good, there was some, <laughs> whatever. You know what? You know what? You can dismiss it if you want, but it was quite the, uh, quite the, scene, quite the scene back then. I think there might be a documentary floating around out there about it somewhere. <laughs> so we have a few more minutes to, uh, to round up the show. And I know we, we do like to get to the mail segment. Yeah. And actually this is a very appropriate one with our guest, Jonathan here. Yes, it is. Actually, he could probably help us answer it. We've got Tracy and what's oh, actually to introduce this too. We do, um, Anybody who has a, a question that they'd like answered from us, they can email us at workinglunch uh, at wcuw.org. So we, you know, month to month, we pick one out and we get that answered. Uh, so this one's from Tracy in Worcester. And she said, what kinds of things should I bring to a job fair? So Jonathan, uh, do you want to... Do you want to take a yeah. guess Maybe before we I go to the I think he needs that mic, though. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, bring up several copies of your resume. Yeah. More, more is better. That they can get at Workforce Central. Uh, they can get them at Workforce Central if they need to, um, but definitely bring a resume. Uh, dress accordingly. What do you, what do you suit, tie? Well, it, it, again, depends on the positions that you're looking for. Not casual, right? though. No, definitely not casual. It's uh, business, business attire. I would yeah. certainly uh, dress uh, above uh, and differentiate, differentiate yourself again. Yeah. Uh, easier said than done. Yeah. Um, several resumes, um, a notepad. If you can, if you can generate some business cards. Yep. You know there are services where you can get uh, so business cards you, for free. So what would you put on that? Just just your general contact information. Your general contact information, maybe some kind of uh, you know uh, title that that uh, pertains to your uh, you know your job uh, the job title that you're seeking yeah. you know business executive for example or you know uh, executive assistant or something something to that degree yeah that to uh, me sounds like something that would really make you stand out oh absolutely absolutely to you go can, to that next step to really right. print out that's the cards right. mm -hmm. bring a bring a and again uh, play the part you know uh, a bifold a, a nice leather bifold or something that's right. clean not a backpack pad. or an old exactly bag or exactly and, you know <laughs> Not nothing that Jeff would come in with, you know. Kind of, you know, step it up a notch, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's what I would bring. What about some of those? Not uh, too much. Uh, uh, intangible things like a thirty-second pitch, like we talked about have that, that elevator prepared. pitch. Have that prepared. And and a firm handshake, uh, eye, contact, eye contact, that kind of, that kind well, of thing. You can't bring that, but you know, once you're there, you would, <laughs> you, would you would hope to present those skills. Uh, and those are those and those are the type of intangibles that you got to have uh, readily available. But you don't want to come in with a briefcase, you know, super large briefcase. Uh, and look like uh, Inspector, uh, or is it uh, Sam Shop Detective? You want to come in there, <laughs> um, professional but clean, you know. Um, and you know, don't don't be overburdened, you know, overbearing with uh, a lot of stuff. You don't want to be carrying backpacks, uh, briefcases, uh, carrying your lunch, you know, brown bag, uh, yeah. things that because you're going to be there for a while. Um, eat beforehand, maybe a bottle of water if you want. Uh, uh, but other than that, you know, less is better. What, what about some some information about the the employers that are there? So a lot of times at a job fair, they'll post the the employers that are going to be there, and you could research. Okay, I'm really interested in St. Vincent's. I should do some some research about the jobs available there, about the company itself. Well, is we'll it be good posting. To do that? Yeah, we'll be posting that, that information as Jeff had asked earlier, uh, relatively soon. And I would ask, I would tell, I would advise anybody to look up those companies, look at the jobs, look at some of the job um, descriptions, so that they, they'll be able to talk about it real quick when they get there. Uh, find the the, uh, the roadmap, if you will, which will list where these companies are located. Map it out. Yeah. Exactly. Map it out. Ma map your plan of attack look at the companies you want to go to first um kind of create a little game plan and then uh, and then work your game plan yeah. you know stay to it stay focused have be prepared to to you know to uh to go in there and, and make a mark and and again utilize the information uh if you need to kind of step out regroup then go back in yeah. uh, there's an area where uh, people can network and sit and kind of gather themselves uh uh you know prepare themselves for that the next session i could jump in too i think you had mentioned before about about not Trying to monopolize time too much. Know when is enough, Correct. and know when to, to make your exit yeah. in a positive way, and, uh, yeah. and keep that in mind too. That they've got a line of people behind you that you know, so they you know they probably appreciate a nice brief pitch and a, and a, and a 
you know, a, a chat and then and then know when to kind of make your exit, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. And, and Jonathan brings up a good point, too, is to have that positive energy. So he, he mentioned going out and kind of gathering yourself. I think that's important because you want even the first employer that you visit to be right. just as enthusiastic as the last one. So Yeah, plan on being there for a while. You know, yeah. if you want to talk to, if you have 10 employers that you really want to speak to, um, you know, talk to five, then get out, take a, take a breather, relax yourself, get you, compose yourself, and then go back in and see the other. So, you know. Yeah. And again, Tracy out there, if you're listening, there, there are workshops available that'll yes. be happening. Go to the Workforce Central MA website to, to see the calendar. Well, we have done it again. We've successfully filled another hour <laughs> of information regarding uh, jobs and, and workforce development. So thank you for, for being with it. Dr. Great. Zakowski and the, and the team from the uh, Cable Services, thank you for being here and, and helping Pleasure. us out uh, another month. And sir, are we ready to... Uh, well, that's the ending music right there. Thanks again for being with us. We'll see you next month. Take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more.